uh, tuned in for this uh, session today. I welcome you all to the third anniversary session of City of Leaders. And I, as I was told yesterday by one of our mentors, he gave me the example of Steven Spielberg. And uh, he said he's one crazy mad guy who kept on chasing the dream even when people said everyone bonkers. Uh, and I think uh, that's uh, uh, that's to us for this third anniversary, especially when uh, when we started, we had no idea why we were starting uh, something called a city movie. As we will just talk about books and we'll talk about uh, inspirations that people can draw from books. Uh, so I should say uh, three years is like thousand days. So it's a journey of thousand days. And today's session is very special. Uh, because we're going to talk about the focus, the meditation, the mindfulness. And I believe books always provide you that kind of uh, space where you can be on your own. You can be isolated, but you can still travel the whole world. Uh, while you are reading, you can be uh, uh, on your own, absolutely in isolation. But you can still be surrounded by thousands and thousands of characters. And I think that's the power of books. And today is a, is a very unique, very special book. We will talk about looking inward. As the title says, it's about how much self-aware are you? And uh, we're privileged for this third anniversary session, none other than our patron, Natasha Bhutta. Uh, she joined us in one of our Sanskrit batches. And that's how our introduction happened. And we did realize her intimation towards uh, knowledge, index systems, uh, being a wellness coach. I would like to formally uh, introduce her to all of you. And also welcome all of you for this uh, session, for joining us, encouraging us. Uh, in taking our journey ahead uh, with such discussions around books that are related to any subject possible. And uh, we look forward, we crave for different kinds of subjects that we can talk in this room. Uh, introducing Natasha Ji to all of you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, a very erudite uh, uh, person herself. Uh, uh, her award winning writing has been published in Forbes.com, TribeGlobal.com, the Asian Wall Street Journal, and International Archives. She's the author of a best selling guide book. On applying to U.S. universities as a wellness expert, uh, Natasha has been a speaker for, for CII, the Naval Center of London, and the Elevate Women's Center. She's a panel uh, to represent India for yoga through the ICCR, Government of India. Uh, she conducts business and creative writing workshops as well as science and yoga-based well-being workshops for companies and individuals. She has been a voluntary uh, faculty with the Art of Living for over 16 years offering its uh, Sudarshan Priya yoga and meditation program for teenagers, adults, and corporates. Uh, she pursued her BA in English at Stanford University and MA in Creative Writing at Boston University in the US. She also holds a law degree from the University of Cambridge, UK. So while we're talking about the focus, we will have to ask Natasha how she manages so many loans and hacks that she has. So much so that uh, I'm also joining her classes on uh, meditation and yoga from tomorrow onwards, I guess. So, Tasha Ji, I welcome you for this session. And please take us into this journey of inwardness. Uh, how can we be more self-aware? And yet again, we welcome Swami and all the people who could join in today. It's truly a privilege to have you all. Swami, Lovely. Ji, thank you so much for such a warm introduction, Mohit Ji. So, sometimes I'm grateful that I did my undergraduate in English because... I think I read more books in those four years than I have read ever since. <laughs> and really, um, I appreciate City Book Leaders a lot because it's really wonderful to get back to what books can offer us. And it's a really a privilege to be here on their third anniversary. And I'm honored to be with us and introduce Swami Poona Chaitanya's book and the discussion that will follow. So as uh, Mohitji shared, uh, we're both teachers with The Art of Living. And, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, our common guru always says is that your presence speaks more than your introduction. And I have to tell you one thing that I love about Swamiji. So he's Dutch, right? As some of you may have been aware. And he grew up in the Netherlands. But his Sanskrit chanting is phenomenal <laughs> so it's so clear the enunciation and it only goes to show how knowledge the true knowledge and wealth is absolutely beyond nationality and all other boundaries so before I introduce Swamiji with background and words 
I would like us to just experience together his presence and invite him to begin with a chant. Let me do the honors. Om Shri Guru Bhyo Namaha Harihi Om Om Bhadrang Karane Bhishruno Yama Deva Bhadram Pashe Maksha Bhiraya Jatra Sthirai Rangai Is Tushto Vagum Sastano Bhihi Vyashema Deva Hitanyadayuhu Swastina Indro Vrathashrava Swastina Pusha Vishwaveda Swasti nastarksho arishtane mihi Swasti no brahaspatir dadhatu Om shanti 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 Guru Brahma Guru Vishnu Guru Devo Mahesh Paraha Guru Sakshat Param Brahma Tasmai Shri Gurave So once I heard uh, Shri Shri Ravi Shankar Ji say, I don't think before I speak. And that would seem counterintuitive, right? Like because we would say, Are soch samaj ke baat karo. Think before, what are you talking about, correct? So what does it mean? I don't think before I speak. It means that it's not me, my small identity talking to you. There is something higher coming to you through me. And when we are here to talk about meditation, this is why I wanted us to chant. I think it's my prayer for all of you and our prayer for all of you, that whatever you are here to hear, you hear through us. So Swamiji, it's great to have you and it's my pleasure to introduce you. So Swamiji was not always Swamiji, okay? He was my friend Alex. <laughs> so, and that's how I met him at the ashram. And uh, we are here to discover what a wonderful journey he's had together. And I have a confession to make right at the onset. So of course, I've been a meditator on the path with uh, Swamiji. We share the same guru. So first I thought, Are, meditation pe book? I mean, you know, an entire book on meditation, it's something you do. I mean, how can you read so much about meditation? You just have to practice it, you know. And um, then I read the book and I thought, wow, it's excellent. This is such an important seva for the world, right? Because it's true, many of the things that he said in the book, that some of us think we're meditating, but we're not. <laughs> Maybe we're not. Some of us are put off by meditation because we think it's too difficult for us. So it's an excellent, excellent uh, companion to have this book, whether you're absolutely new and uh, would just like to spend some time with yourself reading before you interact with the teacher, you know, then get the book. And if you are already starting to meditate, then uh, it's something that maybe offers you something to go back to and say, oh, I remember this, I remember that. No? So um, without further ado, so Swamiji's background, as I mentioned, he's grown up in the Netherlands and he studied Indology in the university there with a specialization in Sanskrit. And he met uh, Shri Shri Ravi Shankarji and has been a teacher with the Art of Living Foundation for many, many years now. He's a, a very senior faculty teaching advanced meditation programs, yoga programs, also a teacher at the yoga school. And um, he's traveled a lot. So when you get the book, you'll see, you know, you, you're part of uh, this journey, which uh, can take you to a train station in Assam or you might find yourself uh, with somebody who speaks Afrikaans, or you might uh, find yourself in a small uh, town in the Netherlands. So uh, it's, it's a wonderful journey that you make together. And uh, he has uh, not only taught people in Northeast India, 
but people in companies, organizations, CEOs, etc. So it's my honor to welcome you, Swamiji, and we're all looking forward to this great discussion. And uh, let me have the privilege of the first question. Let's get right into it. <laughs> okay. So my the most active social media I'm on is LinkedIn. And it fascinates me and shocks me that there are three to four times as many followers for the hashtag mindfulness than there are for the hashtag meditation. I'm like, everybody's barking up the wrong tree. <laughs> so, so Swamiji, this is something that you address bang on without beating around the bush in your book. So let's get that started today. What is the difference between mindfulness, meditation? You quoted Guruji also in the book. So please share a little bit about this with us. Um, well, yeah, so the, the, one of the ideas behind writing this book uh, for me also was to give people a practical guide. Because I think as you see nowadays, uh, as we all know, yoga has become so popular around the world, which is a blessing, of course, for many people. But at the same time, we see all kinds of things that are called yoga, but that may have nothing to do with yoga or very little to do with yoga, or that are just a small part of what yoga has to offer. And I've met people who said, yeah, yeah, I'm also doing yoga. And then you find out it's you not know, just a little bit of exercise every other day, which is fine, of course, it's beneficial. Many people may be doing something, but then yoga has so much more to offer. And I think even more with meditation, we have seen in the last few decades that it has become much more well-known, much more popular. But at the same time, um, with the increased, um, you can say, um, marketing opportunities, we also see that there are many people who offer all kinds of things under the banner of meditation, which may not necessarily really be meditation. So one thing you see now, we have so many apps, you, know, you have meditation apps and people get all excited. Oh, this app offers me two minute meditations that I can squeeze it in to my schedule but then you're not having an authentic meditation experience, nor are you having the real benefits that this beautiful practice has to offer. And uh, I came across some articles um, in the news where, for example, in the UK, there was a leading uh, mindfulness expert who was very proudly announcing that now, you know, we, we also see the, the rise of something called, uh, uh, you know, secular mindfulness, which was celebrated even more because that means everybody can do it. And it put me onto this idea that I thought, you know, it's important also to explain to people what mindfulness actually is and how it is different from meditation. Because I, like uh, Natasha was saying, I travel a lot. And when I was in South Africa uh, last year, um, for example, there was a big company, a corporate who wanted us to do sessions for their employees and for their uh, executives. But they had a big issue with the word meditation. So then from our, uh, you know, one of our um, organizers, they said, okay, you know, we can pitch it as mindfulness. And they were much more happy with that because somehow mindfulness sounds much more secular. You know, meditation may have this religious undertone where some people still have these old fashioned ideas that, oh, you know what, if I'm doing something that, uh, you know, whatever interferes with my belief or, but then if we look at mindfulness and many mindfulness practices, it's not the same, you know. It's part of it, but in mindfulness, what we do is you bring your mind to, to the present moment. You become fully aware of whatever you're doing. This is most uh, the standard mindfulness practices where you take your attention to your breath or to a part of the body or just being fully with what you are doing, whether it is walking, sitting, eating, which is a wonderful thing because most of the time our mind is all over the place <laughs> and that is not always a good thing usually. So this is definitely a big step forward. But then if you look at it, you are still actively engaging your mind. You are still doing something. So even though it is, uh, you can say an improvement, it's not full rest. And at the same time, to start, you already need to be a little bit mindful. So this is a catch-22. I know many people who said, yeah, I've tried it, you know. But then they tell you to keep your attention on your breath or on something and it's not working so well because your mind is all over the place. And then you feel you become aware, actually, how much of a chaos it is inside your head. And then you, you say, oh, this is not for me because it takes some time to get there. You know? 
And at the same time, I've seen people who are very enthusiastic with mindfulness, but then sometimes what happens, they lose the ability to just relax and be. Even when they're just sitting in the park, they say, oh, I have to be mindful of everything. While if we look at meditation, it is one step further. Authentic meditation is where you transcend the mind. No? Like the Buddha called it emptiness. No? And if we look at the yoga scriptures in Patanjali Yoga Sutras, the Rishi Patanjali, he, he very beautifully explains that there is one step called uh, dharana, where you focus the mind. This is what we see as most mindfulness practices. But beyond that is dhyana, is meditation. So I have many years of experience. I've been teaching thousands of people across the world. And I've seen that when people are able to take this next step, when they're able to really meditate, when they get an experience of what it's like to transcend the mind, then you realize that, oh, this is, it's such a relief. You get a break from all the thinking, all the thoughts, and it actually recharges you in a way that is even more effective than sleep. Now, of course, that doesn't mean you don't need to sleep, but 20 minutes of meditation gives your mind the same amount of rest as four to six hours of sleep does. And I think most of us would have experienced, uh, for those of us who are here, especially during this pandemic, during the lockdowns, you know, Physically, you may not be so active during the day. So your five, your six, seven, eight hours of sleep is plenty for the body to, to recover, for you to get well rested. But mentally, we had so much to endure, whether it was all the, the, the challenging news that we have to digest or other kinds of impressions, doing online programs, uh, just being in touch with so many people, your own anxieties and insecurities that even after sleeping eight hours, when you wake up in the morning, you don't feel really fresh. Yes or no? How many people have had this experience? That physically you may be rested, but mentally it's not enough. And even before the pandemic, many people have seen this, you know, where we have so many impressions to deal with because life is speeding up. We are exposed to much more that that same amount of rest mentally or emotionally doesn't cut it. And we don't have an alternative. We only know, okay, you can sleep because whether it is watching a nice movie, uh, listening to some soothing music, it may be pleasant, but it doesn't give you rest. You know? It still tires you. You, know? you. you listen to any beautiful music or watch a really inspiring documentary. After a few hours, if, if, if not before that, you will say, okay, but now switch it off for some time. Oh, I need a break. However nice it may be, sooner or later, it will tire you. And meditation is the only thing that can give us that kind of rest that will allow the mind not just to recharge, but even to, to unwind, you know, to, to drop so many of these unnecessary impressions. And that is when you start seeing that, oh, suddenly I am able to experience that inner peace again. You get more clarity. Things we have never learned, either at home or at school, you know, how to really manage our mind, how this thing works. And uh, I've shared many of these things in the book, of course, but this is something that meditation has to offer, offer us, which lies beyond mindfulness. So mindfulness definitely has its benefits. A lot of research has also been done. But then there is so much more to discover beyond that. And for those of us who know uh, um, about uh, Vishen Lakhiyan, you know, the founder of Mind Valley, it's an online uh, platform. He offers many masterclasses and a wonderful person. He had come once to uh, interview uh, our master, Sri Sri Ravi Shankarji. And he asked her this question. He said, no, what do you have to say about meditation becoming uh, well-known, especially in the West, uh, as a mindfulness practice, mostly? And uh, Sri Sri Ravi Shankarji said a very interesting, beautiful thing that sums the whole thing up quite nicely. He said, mindfulness is like you come home, you drive your car home and you park it in the garage. But... Meditation is when you come out of the car and you get into your house, your bedroom or your living room. So even though you stop, like you've reached your home, you're in the garage, but your garage is not your living room. No? So you have to get out of the car. If you're sitting in your garage, it doesn't give you the same kind of comfort and rest as it would if you would be in your living room. And if it is your living room, then it's not really a living room, then it's a garage. No? You cannot park your car in the living room. So the book is also an invitation for people who may have been practicing mindfulness or, or meditation to go a, little, uh, go a little deeper. There are very beautiful tips also for those who have been meditating maybe to 
uh, yeah, to, to Im- you can say improve is not the right word, but to maybe make it a little easier, you know, how to deal with some of the, the common challenges on this journey of meditation, maybe how to go a little deeper and, and also some practical tips, how to find the time and be regular, you know, because this is also a challenge. We have so many things that we know we should be doing, whether it is exercising or, uh, you know, catching up with your family or meditating or doing yoga, but then how to find that time. So yeah, there are many practical tools. Great, super. Thank you, Swamiji. So um, yeah, I think uh, from what it sounds like uh, and what I understand uh, from experience and what you've just shared, if you meditate, you will automatically get the benefits of mindfulness. You will, you can't but be more mindful of everything that you're doing, but not necessarily the other way around, right? Yes. Um, so, Amitri, you mentioned, uh, you touched upon briefly Patanjali's Yoga Sutras and what um, yoga is. And yoga is also something, uh, an ancient practice which has now traveled all over the world. And in that has also, to some extent, gotten distorted in different ways. And uh, one of the things that uh, this leads me to what I wanted to also discuss with you. So in the Yoga Sutras, uh, you know, there are different uh, limbs that have been described. So you have principles of yoga and yoga practitioners often associate yoga with the asanas and then, uh, you know, also pranayams, breathing practices and meditations. You know, I distinctly remember in a yoga, uh, many years ago in a yoga class that I attended, a participant asking a teacher, um, this is in a, stu- uh, a, a not an art of living, a, a studio program. And I remember participant asking the teacher, could you teach me meditation? And uh, she just said, and like to the whole class, like, oh, no, 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 no. Even I don't know meditate. <laughs> That's for really, really, really advanced people. <laughs> and, uh, and I was already teaching meditation and I was so stunned that I said, uh, I, I, oh my God, I need to correct this. <laughs> and uh, so this is also a myth that people have that you need to progress from the body to the breath. Then when you're really advanced, you can meditate. But you share in your book that um, your very first introduction uh, to the art of living was a meditation with Sri Sri Ravi Shankar. And uh, in the Netherlands with thousands of people present, correct? Like many people, th- people also think, oh, meditation, I can't have a good experience. There's so many people. How can I meditate? You know, it has to be one-on-one. My guru has to be only with me, etc. So um, could you share a little bit about that starting point for you? And um, also you had that experience when you were 16 years old. So uh, I think we have a mixed audience and many times people who are young feel like that's something you do when, you know, when you retire. So could you share a little bit about that journey with us? Yeah. So um, one thing that I should add also is that even though I was born and brought up in the Netherlands, um, I am only 75% Dutch officially. The other 25% uh, happens to be Punjabi. Uh, I have a grandfather, had a grandfather who was from, uh, from Delhi and my mother was born in Delhi. So her father was Indian, but when she was very young, she came to the Netherlands. And when I was born, when we grew up, me and my brother, I have a younger brother. Um, it so happened that during their university days, my parents, uh, they had both studied uh, psychology and they had an experience. Uh, they did a, a meditation course. Some of their friends had heard about it. They thought this is very interesting. And it really appealed to them. They started practicing. So they used to meditate once in a while. So I remember when I was very young, this was still the case. Uh, so it was a curious thing, of course, you know, as a young child, you don't know so much about it. And we also used to sometimes do so. You sit eyes closed, try not to move, you know, try not to think of anything. But may- maybe that seed was there. And then when I grew up, um, I had a very strong, keen interest in the, towards the traditions of the East. So whether it is Hinduism, Buddhism, uh, you know, the, the, the Eastern martial arts. So I started practicing various martial arts, Judo, Taekwondo, Aikido, uh, Kung Fu, uh, Ninpo Bujutsu, different things. And I realized over the years that it was more the, the tradition, the values, you know, you can say the spiritual aspect of the martial arts that really pulled me. You know, I was not so much into the competition and, and the fighting part. 
and then uh, you know how is how it goes you start reading different books you know as a teenager you want to explore you prefer not to ask people you want to find out for yourself so i used to read different books and then uh, i heard that uh, uh, a spiritual master from india is coming to the netherlands there's a public talk i was like oh i don't want to miss this chance you know when do you get to meet a spiritual master so we went for this public program and one thing for me that stood out which as uh, natasha mentioned it is also mentioned in the book is that um, he he gave a wonderful talk about human values uh, very practical very down to earth simple language but very profound truths so that is something that also appealed you know it was not something airy fairy or very over your head sophisticated complicated very practical but very profound but then he had a he conducted a guided meditation so he told everyone you know you can sit comfortably close your eyes and simple instructions but for me what really struck me and which stuck with me is that after some time when he asked us to open our eyes i thought okay you know you feel nice fresh but it felt like just 2 3 minutes and i realized that 25 minutes had passed so that was my you can say first experience with meditation proper meditation i had been you know, of course trying different things on my own uh, as maybe some of us have also done you, know, you sit you just want to relax or keep your attention on your breath or try not to think of anything but this was a new experience and i was like you know where did i go you know on one hand i know i was aware because i heard all the instructions <clears throat> and i thought i was having different thoughts but then that was only for a few minutes which means there were whole gaps in between where there were no thoughts and i felt very nice very fresh so for me that was a you can say that teaser or that sample which got me hooked i said okay now i want to explore more this is something authentic that i have found and that is where um, i started uh, when there was an opportunity i did one of the programs that was being offered Uh, by his organization by the art of living there i i, I did a meditation course and i i found it more and more interesting because like i mentioned earlier we have never learned how the mind works and this used to also it used to bug me a little no that you're sitting in school i'm sure all of us remember uh, or in college and then you know, especially in school the teacher sometimes will tell you you know pay attention focus concentrate and you're sitting in the classroom and it's not that you don't want to concentrate but how to do it you know it's easy for him to say if you could concentrate whenever you wanted to life was much easier in your studies uh, in your exams wherever you go i mean even now for those of us you know in your work most of the time when you're sitting and doing things you may be doing many other things also or you are supposed to do one thing but you keep thinking of this and then your mind goes somewhere else and so you're not really efficient <laughs> you may be sitting there for 2 hours trying to finish something thinking that i would like to go for a walk now what if you would just finish it in 1 hour and actually go for the walk or watch the movie or spend time with your friends or whatever it is so this used to bug me that you know we have spent so many god knows how many years so much of time so much of energy so much of money studying learning using our brain our mind but nobody has ever really taught us how it works which means any time it can become a disaster you know i mean we've all had this experience it may be wonderful you're in a beautiful place you've gone for a holiday you get one message or phone call that something has gone wrong or and it spoils everything you cannot enjoy it you know? or you may be really stressed about something or really anxious you have the most tasty food in front of you but you can't enjoy it and i think during this pandemic what really um you know it really made me think that for me as a meditation practitioner if i had not had these practices and this knowledge of how to manage my mind i don't know how it would have been and it it's a little scary because it made me wonder all those people who don't have any such knowledge or techniques how are they coping you know and of course some ha- some are not coping you know some haven't that is the sad thing i used to get so many calls messages people were really in a in a position where they said i don't know what to do with myself or i don't know how to help this other person at home or somewhere else and we were doing what we could you no know, reaching out through people online 
But then it also made me realize that there is a need to see how we can reach this knowledge to more and more people because it can really make all the difference. So, so many questions people have asked. One is, uh, you mentioned, you know, during your experience uh, with the, the first meditation, there was a point when there were no thoughts. So one question relates to thoughts that some uh, meditation practitioners are used to their teachers saying, you know, focus, don't have any thoughts, you know, don't think about X, Y, Z. And then there are some who have uh, teachers who say, you know, don't worry about your thoughts, let them come and go. So that's one question from our audience. Can you speak about thoughts and meditation? And another one is, uh, how can meditation help us live more sustainable lives? Which is probably what you were coming to with reference to how, for instance, in the current times, it has helped or can help. Please. Yeah, I mean, sustainable in which sense? Um, I think, Any idea? no, that question said sustainable and my, my thought is maybe it means more sustained life, like yeah. sustain that happiness through life, you know, Yeah. sustain that equanimity. See, one thing is that we have to now really wake up and realize that, um, that we are not just a body, you know, we are a body-mind complex or body-mind-spirit complex. And even if we look at, at modern medicine, most of the health problems, if we leave out uh, communicable diseases, uh, you know, uh, pandemics and, uh, and, and those things, most of the health problems people are facing nowadays are what they call psychosomatic. You know? They are partially or entirely created by stress. We see people having so many health conditions ranging from heart problems, diabetes, uh, so many things, which most of them are to a great extent because not just because of a sh not so great lifestyle maybe but mainly because they people are under a such an amount of stress and we are not made for that you know we have this you know you may remember that term from high school biology that fight or flight response where if you're scared of something uh, you know like in the old days you have to run from a tiger or you know there is danger then all the energy goes to your muscles and you can survive. All that adrenaline, everything will help, will save you there. But nowadays we are so stressed. We have so many stimuli that create stress for us that you're almost continuously sometimes living in that fight or flight state, which means you're not functioning properly. You cannot think as clearly and you're producing all these stress hormones, which are going to take a toll on your system. So I'll not get into all the details, but basically it's much more healthy not to be stressed. But again, how do you do that? You know, because there are so many things that will stress you out. You know? As a sane human being, if you're not totally insensitive, you just have to turn on the news and you can freak out. You know? Because they will, they will serve you whatever has gone wrong in five minutes. <laughs> Earlier, if you know, something happened in your village, you may hear about it. Now anything happens anywhere in the world, you'll get to know. And that too with all the visuals and everything. So... In the same way, if we look at our relationships, when you are peaceful, when you are happy, you're a much nicer person to be around. People will like to be with you and you're able to contribute much more. Your empathy is more, you are more sensitive, more sensible. In your work, your perception, observation, expression, everything improves when you are peaceful. So even though our mind is overused, but it is the most underutilized part of our existence learning so that is why the first few chapters in the book i actually go into this that okay what are the laws that govern our mind how does it work how can you manage it and then to come to the second question you know we have to understand that when you relax meditation is a state of deep rest deep relaxation when you relax your body naturally starts throwing off stress and unwanted impressions and uh, and tension. No? What happens in sleep also to some extent. And that is why some of us, I don't know, anybody here has had some experience with meditation? Anybody has dabbled or maybe even practiced? Lovely. So for those of us, you may have had this experience that sometimes, maybe even just once or twice, but you sit for a meditation and suddenly some arm goes like this, <laughs> you know, or something twitches or... So on the physical level, your body is throwing off stress, you know. It used to happen sometimes to me and at first I was like, you know, what's wrong, you know almost think you may have some condition, but, but this is like, even it may happen sometimes in a yoga class also. When we do yoga and then you lie down for that final relaxation 
And suddenly some leg will go a little bit like this or one arm or body starts releasing this, the, the, the tension and the stresses that have been accumulated. But this doesn't only happen on the physical level. It happens on the mental level also. And that is where random thoughts may come up in meditation, which does not mean you're not meditating. It means that it's like you're deleting those unnecessary files. But then here the skill is not to get stuck with it because then if you start analyzing, well, then, it, then you start thinking. So there's a difference between thinking and having thoughts. And the beauty is with regular meditation practice, you will find that the intensity of the thoughts, the amount of thoughts and the quality of the thoughts, well, the intensity and the quality and the amount becomes less and the quality becomes more. So you'll have less thoughts, you have more coherent thoughts, more pleasant thoughts. And this will reflect in all aspects, like even your memory. Most of the time, it's not that we don't remember things. Your memory works very nicely. But most of the time, the things you remember are totally useless at that point. And it may even be things that trouble or disturb you. And then sometimes when you really need to remember something, it may not come fully. So you will find with a regular meditation practice that those unnecessary things become less and less. Your memory becomes much more clear. It's easier to remember and something and it's, it becomes more proper. And even you will find that, and this is a little more subtle, but even your intuition becomes much more clear. You're in, yeah, everybody has an intuition, but because we have so much of noise in our head, it's very difficult to perceive it. Like it doesn't come through pro properly. And you will find for those of us who've been meditating a little longer, you will see this, that intuitively you'll start getting this thing. Oh, you know, you get a thought, oh, I should call this person and they will call you. Or you call them and they said, oh, you know, I was just thinking of you or you find out they really needed to speak to you or you think something will happen and it happens. So you become much more sensitive to your environment. Um, so there are numerous benefits and all of them will contribute to a more happy, healthy and successful life. So that way, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the book, nowadays, personally, I really feel, I believe this and I've seen this, that in our current situation, our society, our world, meditation is not a luxury, it is a necessity. True. So what would be, um, I'm, so all of us who are here, we're definitely going to request Swamiji to guide us through meditation before the end. So don't miss that. Uh, but we do have someone eager who has asked, what would be the first step that someone needs to take on this journey? Mm -hmm. I, th I, I would say that if you are here, you've already taken one step. And by the end of the session today, you will know what your next step is. But, but I would like to, uh, of course, we, the question is to you, Swamiji. It's not an easy question. Um, it's one of the questions I used to keep getting that also prompted me to write this book. Um, because the tricky thing is, you know, to, to choose anything, to make a well-informed decision, we need to know a little bit about it. No, that is why so many people are happy about Amazon reviews. <laughs> I mean, even I, I catch myself before buying anything, however nice it may sound, you check the reviews because suddenly you see three people saying, oh, this product is crap. <laughs> and then you think, oh, let me try another brand. Yes or no. It looks like a very nice, uh, whatever, protein powder or something. And then someone is saying, you know, it tastes like sawdust or it's not, it's not working for me. And then you think, oh, this is not going to fly. No? So the thing is, I don't want to, and I made a point, made it a point in my book that I also don't want to, um, in any way, stop people from having their choice, you know, having their their opportunity to choose. You know? Like many people, if you see you read a book on meditation, they will say, okay, you should meditate this way, and that may be the way they are teaching, they are practicing. And there's nothing wrong with that, but I understand that right now, not everybody may have access to one particular type of meditation. Not everybody may be inclined to one particular type of meditation because there are so many teachers, so many masters, so many things available. And I also don't feel that I am in a position to judge another school of thought or another technique. And that way also, I think this book is useful for anyone. It's not say, okay, someone says, okay, I like art of living or oh, very good, but this is equally useful for someone who may be practicing uh, meditation that they have learned in, in their school. But what I've tried to do in the book is that I've given uh, people a, a better understanding of, okay, what meditation can be, 
and what are some of the things you can pay attention to just to avoid that you end up with you know like i said a, a mindfulness app or uh, or something that may not give you as much benefit as an authentic meditation practice could so the first step i would say is especially with it comes to something uh, as subtle as meditation is to first understand a little bit what meditation is and then you can choose and the same i would say for yoga you know because if you end up in a in a beer yoga fest it is really not yoga <laughs> people getting drunk doing exercise okay it's a creative way of spending your evening or morning or or afternoon but it has nothing to do with yoga so the same way if you know a little bit okay what yoga has to offer then you will immediately see if your yoga local yoga class can offer you that or not otherwise i would say that uh, another option is to find a proper teacher no? because of course no if you have a, a proper teacher available there then that also a person can guide you but uh, not everybody may directly have access to someone or feel like going uh, looking around for for someone so that way this book will offer you a chance to also from the comfort of your home or a nice holiday location to yeah to start exploring uh, we have a question uh, directly from an audience member uh, thank you for uh, enlightening us um my question is that i'm going to get to the book i haven't read the book unfortunately so i will definitely get to the book but in the meantime i want to take a shortcut and ask you a question and that is so how does one um break this cycle of not being able to uh get into a routine so like you said earlier that uh, uh you want to do your yoga you want to do various practices you need to do drink a certain type of tea first thing in the morning so everything <laughs> they tell you do first thing in the morning and there's only yeah. so much you can do Terrible, first thing right? so <laughs> how do you um yeah i struggle with that the discipline of doing it and then of course you are told you must do it for 1 hour and that sounds so intimidating and so okay, okay 20 minutes sounds doable but how do you uh get yourself into that disciplined state of mind so in the in the book also i've given few exercises for people who uh, for example even just to find a time like you said so for meditation actually 15 20 minutes is a is a perfect time 20 minutes is is perfect uh, it doesn't have to be one hour uh, even if i have to do one hour in a stretch i don't think i would be able to fit it in anywhere <laughs> and uh, it doesn't have to be the first thing to do in the morning also yes of course little bit our stomach should be light uh, but you know that's why uh, sometimes even in my programs when people ask me you know should we do it sunrise or morning or i said listen any time is a good time to meditate because our mind is very smart if you say it has to be the first thing and then if you say okay i have to have my tea also then you had your tea then you say oh today i can't do it okay then i'll do it tomorrow exactly. so th- we have to find that balance at the same time um a great help is when we realize really understand that this is something that is important for me you know so uh, in the book also uh, i've given i've elaborated a little bit on how to get to that point because this is what we see you know at some point when you really realize that i need to do this you will find the time you know like we have learned at some point that it's good to brush our teeth you know as a small child you didn't feel like it your mom used to make you do it maybe but somewhere you realize that yes this is beneficial or this is needed and that is why every day you brush your teeth i mean i'm presuming i'm hoping everybody has that habit it's it's uh, highly recommended for you and your near and dear ones but you don't say sometimes that oh you know i was too busy so i didn't brush my teeth or i didn't take a bath or i didn't have food today because i was too busy i had so many meetings no you will find time because you know without it it will be a, you know it will not work and for me it is i've come to a point uh, where i know that even if it means i have to get up a little earlier in the morning i'll make sure i do i take a little time for my practice or otherwise in the evening because i have experienced and i know the difference it makes throughout the day the quality of my energy level my clarity of mind i am much more efficient uh, i am much more happy you know we would have all have had this experience right that the same situation on some days can really throw you off balance or really irk you irritate you and another day it doesn't really bother you because your energy level is much higher 
you know you feel much more centered or more set more peaceful so we do so many things during the day hoping that we will feel happy but this is like a shortcut what i've seen you know where you already put your mind in the right space or put the right space into your mind and um so this is one thing where you realize that oh yes this is really something i have to do and then one more thing is um and of course again it's you need to have a little bit of discipline already for that but is to have a commitment for a fixed number of days and it doesn't have to be 6 months or 1 year but uh, in the scriptures actually it's interesting they say that you should do something for 48 days this is called a mandala and if you do it for 48 days consecutively so you cannot have one day break also if you break it one day you have to start again but if you do it for 48 consecutive days anything it becomes a habit so this is something that that it's still doable so you can mark it on your calendar because definitely you can celebrate no when you succeed um but this is something that even i have uh, i have i practice because like you said sometimes no you you realize i should do this or uh at least for some time whether it is exercising or having that special tea or uh doing something else and the beauty is that just like with learning languages and and other things once you start getting the hang of it like you do this two three times it becomes easier so this is actually a very valuable tool for anything in life because most people are successful because of their discipline whatever it may be you know whether it is uh in in sports in academics in 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 stock trading <laughs> so discipline can really help us and uh yeah this is one one trick you can try anything you want to take it up see if you can you can apply some of these principles that's a good uh, point uh, thank you so much thank you my pleasure and also do you think swami ji on that same thing maybe um, you know the power of sangha you know being with a community uh so i often wonder that you know why do we have this uh, weekly free follow up <laughs> you know and and it's actually when i see the people who have been coming over the years on the path that that's actually what keeps people connected you know after you do a program to have that group and move together maybe that's why also ashrams are created so you have that sangha right like definitely okay. yes yes of course i i mentioned this in my book as well at the end that uh, because we see this in in all the traditions you know like the same way the buddha emphasized so much on the sangha you no know? he said the buddha dharma and the sangha because when you have a group of people whenever you feel a little low someone else will pull you up you know and vice versa you know so that way if you have a few people like now we have this accountability and buddy system i've seen even uh, online people are doing it i had a, an interesting live session with a wonderful uh, lady the other day and she was saying that she just to have some accountability because uh what she would do is every morning she will post a picture on her instagram story after her workout and if one day she doesn't do that some of her followers and friends will start messaging her that hey where is your workout picture you didn't work out so just that i did it sell that oh people will otherwise ask me or question me is another push you know the same way if you have a neighbor and you always go for a run together if you don't uh, if you're not ready he will ring the bell he'll say oh come on come on let's go you know time to go and whenever he doesn't feel like maybe you will pull him along so this is another thing that uh, definitely it can make a big difference have some people who yeah to do it together and that's why also sometimes you know for a practice like this um it is nice to uh, for some people if you say at home i have too many distractions so to get into the practice that is why sometimes you no know, we have this meditation retreats things like that so that at least you can get a little bit into that uh zone to that uh, yeah habit before you have to manage all by yourself so one last quick question which you can answer as succinct with a quick answer as possible and uh, then guide us through at least a 5 7 minute uh, meditation So um so one of the things that uh, was fascinating for me to discover on the path is that uh the siddhas or the enlightened beings are uh, even actually above what one might call devtas 
and in your book there are so swami ji's book has a sprinkling of wonderful stories some are personal stories of his own experience some are of his uh, participants students some are people he's interacted with and their wisdom sutras at the end of each chapter so there were two fascinating stories uh, related to this where uh, both a king and a bishop seek out saints <laughs> you know so can you share some light on that you know in today's world where everybody's running after that power or that money or um... something may look no we say no the grass is greener on the other side so we see people who may be able to afford the things that we are really looking for and you think oh this is the ideal place to be you know you have enough money to buy what you want life would be so wonderful but then if you talk to the people who have more money than what they need to buy the things they want you realize that they are also still looking for things you know so we i very nicely in one of the chapters explained how we get into this habit of postponing our own happiness and our own sense of freedom and what is the way out of that cycle that loop and i think uh even today if you are very honest any uh, i mean almost any product that is marketed with the intention of making you feel that it can give you that sense of freedom or peace of mind will show you someone doing yoga or meditation yes or no i mean you've seen it whether it is a soap uh, um, you know an all terrain vehicle or uh, a special deodorant or whatever it can be but if it's supposed to make you feel happy and peaceful they may show someone sitting and meditating or looking very zen so people are somewhere people realize that oh this is what i'm looking for and if you have a proper saint and you see that he is so peaceful so happy then you say oh but that's what i want you know and it's rare to find that uh, i've yet to come across people you know who are in that standard category of very successful businessmen or politicians or artists who look like that and and i've worked with such people i've conducted programs literally for for presidents like heads of state uh, for top ceos for people who are really among the richest richest in the country also i i'll not name the names for their privacy sake but uh, you know really some of the you can say the big names uh, in india and they are also looking for the same thing you know and and it's beautiful to see that they also they're interested to learn more about meditation or Uh, and they're benefiting from it so i've shared some of those stories to maybe nudge people in that direction lovely so can you guide us swamiji uh, yes so you have to be very, very honest in my, in my book i made it a point to specify that you know something like a 2 3 meditation doesn't really i know <laughs> but, but we can't imagine you know uh, so maybe uh, let me see if i can give you a glimpse uh, let me state that a a proper 15 20 meditation minutes meditation is is again an even better experience but at least let us uh, you know when you go to a nice ice cream place like this italian ice cream and then it's a little more expensive but it looks really good and it's high quality so then if you're not sure which one to choose they have this small spoons no like really can juice <laughs> that small spoons and then you say okay i want to taste mango flavor and they'll give you this tiny scoop to taste for free So I'll give you a small scoop now, and then uh, I would like to invite all of you, of course, to explore the book. Uh, and definitely, also uh, feel free to share it with people. No, now so many people are dealing with so much of stress, and they don't know what to do with themselves. Uh, maybe this can also help them. So, so let us sit comfortably. And it's fine to have a back support, but your back should be a little bit straight. But then sit comfortably and easily, and let us close our eyes. We'll do a short. Uh, short meditation and take a normal deep breath in and breathe out once more breathe in gehri saans le and then you can breathe out through the mouth with a ha sound we'll do this one last time take a deep breath in and breathe out through the mouth and then keeping the eyes closed consciously relax the whole body
Relax your neck and your shoulders. Relax your face. Relax your hands. Keep a gentle smile on your face. Breathe in and breathe out. The incoming breath energizes the body and the outgoing breath relaxes the body. Become aware of this phenomenon that is happening all the time. Once more, breathe in. And breathing out, relax more and more. Now for the next few moments, keep your body totally still, immobile. Like a stone or a statue. You are like the Buddha statue. unmoving. The only thing that is moving is the breath, which is moving in and out of the body on its own, effortlessly. Your body is totally still. Even if you feel like moving some part of the body, resist. Just bear with it for some time. As the body is still, the mind also starts to settle down on its own, effortlessly. Allow the mind to settle down. Whatever thoughts may be coming up in the mind, do not resist. Whether good thoughts or bad thoughts, just let them come and go on their own. Now let go of all efforts and relax.
right now there is nothing to do and nothing to know. Let go of all efforts and relax. Take another deep breath in. And breathe out. Become aware of your body and the surroundings. Once more, breathe in and breathe out. If you wish, you can move your fingers a little. And then very slowly and gradually taking your own time, whenever you feel complete, you may open your eyes again. Thank you so much, Swamiji. So just a small Glimpse, small taste, but... Thank you, Swamiji. One of the things that Swamiji also talks about uh, in his book is uh, how your meditation is deeper and more powerful and yields more to you when you have reverence. Reverence for the technique, respect for yourself, for the tradition. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mohiji, again for having us. And please, I request you to address us at the very end. Thank you so okay. much. So after this little scoop of ice cream, I don't think I have anything to be you as the best sweet offering. And what else can we ask for the third uh, anniversary celebration? Thank you, Natasha, for roping and designing this complete session. Thank you very much, Swami. I think uh, this is completely a journey and everything happens for a reason. Even uh, Mohitji, you had a chance to read the book, no? It was so nice to, to hear your it's experience. A, it's a lovely book and I think, uh, I don't want to say that I read it fast, as you say that there's nothing three minute or a five minute capsule. But once I started reading this book, there was nothing else to do per se. You know, you are stuck into the amazing stories. And I must say this is actually a story book. It's a story book on on looking into it with meditation and uh, uh, mindfulness. Uh, thank you very much, Swamiji, for bringing this gift to the world. And for My pleasure. To everyone, to, to, to all the guests who can join. Thank you very, very much. Thank you.